Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're continuing our interview with Chris Williams on the climate change crisis and what to do about it, and can capitalism offer a solution? Now joining us in the studio is Chris Williams. Hi, Chris. Thanks Hello. for joining us. Mm -hmm. So one more time, Chris is a longtime environmental activist. He's an author of Ecology and Socialism, Solutions to Capitalist Ecological Crisis. His uh, science background academically, and he's he heads up the science department at Packer Collegiate Institute and adjunct professor at Pace University and other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think one of the things in the back of the minds, and, and, and I've certainly heard this from various, you know, entrepreneurs, capitalists, whatever you want to call them, uh, that they figure out w w when it gets really bad, we're going to come up with a technological fix. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one way or the other, we'll throw stuff up in the atmosphere and whether it's one method or the other, um, you know, we'll, we'll figure this out because we, you know, once, almost as you said in the previous thing, once we throw enough money at this issue, we'll figure a way to solve it. And, uh, and we're just not ready to throw all this money at it, but when it gets serious enough, we will. What do you make of that? I think it's, a f oh, well, I think in terms of geoengineering and geoengineering projects, I think we're already doing one. It's the biggest one out there, right? We're geoengineering the atmosphere to create a different climate. So uh, what the you're talking about is, I mean, generally speaking, within the framework of what's acceptable for a debate as possible solutions, there are three things that people point to, right? One, the, the market will change things, right? That's where cap and trade comes from. Two, it's not really our fault anyway, it's individual people. And if you just buy the right things, uh, then, you know, green but products. But people that are in the know, know that that, like, like, like the Pentagon had a report, was it right. three, four years ago, that saying climate change is one of the most serious national security problems we face. And I mean, the elites know, but don't they in the back of their minds think, uh, someday we'll just throw money at this and we'll fix it, not by reducing carbon emission, really, by, th by dealing with it through some geoengineering. So what yeah. are the geoengineering things that are being talked about and what do you make of them? Well, uh, I don't make much of them at all, actually, because the third thing is the, the, this idea that technology will save us. Uh, we can continue with the same social system, and when we run into problems, we'll just overcome them through some other uh, technology that we may or may not know right now. It's the same way that they overcome you know, depletion of fish in the oceans. It's not like, let's reevaluate how much fishing is going on, put some regulation in place and stuff. No, they, they don't do that. They start fish farming, you know, another technology. And then when that's not enough, they don't reevaluate that strategy. They actually invent a new one, which is genetic engineering of the fish, so they grow faster, and so on. Well, um, I mean, they'd argue they did do a fix. I mean, if the, if the absolutely. issue is food supply, they uh, increase food supply. Absolutely. But, uh, I mean, Monsanto makes the same argument. I know right. the, the critique of Monsanto, obviously, but still, the argument is we've got technology, we have more food. Right. That, of course, that, the, the, that the what cost that so many people are starving is not right, a problem. Right. Um, and in terms of the climate, yes, there are a number of different schemes. Um, for example, one would be to throw vast quantities of iron filings into the oceans so that that will stimulate the production of plankton, which will then explode in population. They die and they sink to the bottom and take their carbon with them. That's one problem. We don't know what the ramifications of that would be, just like we don't know exactly the ramifications of genetically modifying fish. Uh, another m scheme is to put uh, thousands and tens of thousands of tiny mirrors into space to reflect sunlight back, uh, you know, before it even reaches the Earth. Uh, each scheme is kind of madder than the last one, and that's like put a, a trillion dollars. So they're thinking about that, while they won't think about simpler things like close down po power stations and build solar and wind farms. Uh, they're also thinking about firing thousands of uh, artillery shells filled with sulfur into the atmosphere which will block some of the sunlight and actually reduce the warming. But the biggest problem with all of these schemes, apart from we don't know what the secondary effects would necessarily be, the big, and they're enormously expensive, the biggest problem is once you start down that road, like you're still emitting uh, fossil fuel carbon pollution, which is why you're ge doing ge geoengineering, but once you start that process, then you can't stop because you're continuing to put more pollution into the atmosphere. And so if you ever stopped, you'd have to, and, and that lasts for 100, 200 years. And so you're having to do that for decades and decades until you stop producing fossil fuels. So what's the point, right? You, you actually, 
uh, make the Earth even more unstable by allowing the process that you should be stopping to continue as long as you do something else over here. And that's uh, the only reason for it is to preserve the system as it currently exists with all the power but, relations in place. Right, but that's a big uh, reason if you're one of these people sitting on piles of cash and like the current system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I don't think it's not going to work. It's going to make things even worse. And, and what happens if you have to stop for whatever reason? Stop uh, putting stuff, mirrors yeah, and air any or iron of, in the sea. Yeah, any number of things. Because you find out that it, does, it has these other secondary effects which are really negative, like acidifying the atmosphere, for example, if you put sulfur and ends up as sulfur dioxide. So... Um, I don't see that as a, any kind of solution. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know enough about. I can't give you an argument for myself. I can imagine a uh -huh. counter argument. Is uh -huh. that the same argument happened about nuclear energy? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't if you unlock these forces. Not only do you, does it lead to bombs, but you who have no idea what the repercussions of of having this kind of energy source. But on the whole, and even a lot of environmentalists are saying now, nuclear energy is a, is a possible option here because there needs to be a quick fix. And the only quick fix people can see is nuclear energy. Before we get into the specifics of that, mm -hmm. but wasn't there some of the same caution about it that you just shouldn't go down this road because you don't know the repercussions? And to some extent, you could say nuclear energy, they know the repercussions and and, and it's, you know, on the whole, it hasn't been the, as unsafe as a lot of people thought it was going to be. Well, uh, I guess it depends on where you're living in the, in the world, because I was in Fukushima just after the explosion, and, and I can tell you nobody is interested in um, nuclear power there, and for very good reason. Uh, I mean, they're living in fear because they have no idea what they've been exposed to, what their children are exposed to, whether they'll ever be able to go back to where they used to live. Many of them won't. Uh, but, but, so. it's, but, but there's lots of nuclear reactors all over the world, and many of them are managed in a way, at least so far, it seems safe. I mean, mm -hmm. in, you know, there's always a place where mismanagement or corruption or mm -hmm. you know, bad design, but, and, and of course, if sometimes the repercussions can be horrendous if you're, horrendous if you're talking nuclear energy. Right. But there's lots of reactors that aren't blowing up and, and such. Thankfully, yes, uh, out of the 400. Uh, I mean, they, they, they officially, they're not supposed to have any meltdowns more than one every 10,000 years. But at the moment, they're running at one every decade. So um, I think that that's problematic, to say the least. I, th there's a reason also, there's a couple of reasons why I would not be for that as a solution. Um, one is the p potential for catastrophic accidents. But more importantly, uh, perhaps, or arguably, the, there's no nuclear reactors being built by any private corporation anywhere on the world in the world. They already know. There are many reports from Citibank. Nuclear is completely uneconomic. It wouldn't exist without government supporting it. So you have to ask the question, why do they support it if it's so ridiculously expensive? That's one question. The second question is, um, not only is nuclear power uneconomic without vast government subsidies, but it takes a decade, two decades to build them. So we'd, be have, to have, we'd have to build a nuclear power plant a week uh, in order to build out, reduce the fossil fuel production and, and ex uh, move into nuclear power more seriously. But nuclear power is going in the opposite direction, pretty much everywhere in the world with a few exceptions like China. So how is it, for example, that Germany is now providing 40% of its energy from wind and solar? And solar, you know, northern, Ger northern Europe is not particularly sunny, but they've managed it and they're closing down their nuclear plants by 2022. Uh, and they have more, a higher percentage, 30% of their electricity comes from nuclear compared to here, which is only about 18. So um, I think that uh, nuclear power, f based on economics, based on safety, but also based on the, the time scale that we're talking about needing to make change, you can, make, you can build a, a one gigawatt wind farm in three months, right? A one gigawatt nuclear power station takes at least 10 years and billions of dollars. The last one they built in the United States took 26 years. So I, I, well, so. I was getting us into nuclear, and I, I think it's good we kind of got <laughs> into it, but I was getting into it from the point of view of geoengineering. Right. That, you know, sometimes these predictions are that the horrendous things will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, is it not possible to test and model some of the geoengineering techniques so that you don't have these secondary consequences that are uncontrollable? I think it is possible if we lived in a rational and logical society where you could trust 
what's coming out of various different reports. But I think that that's difficult to do under capitalism. You know, I, I, my background is in science. I'm all for research. I think we should be researching lots of things more vigorously than we are. The problem is that when you pull the profit motive into it, then uh, your desire to get things to market before your competitor does, uh, maybe when you haven't done all of the testing that you should have, uh, maybe prior to all the checks and balances are in place, uh, people cut corners here and there to save money in the production process, let alone the design process. If you, you know, it's possible if we were living in a society where all of those things could be evaluated objectively with regards to nuclear power or with regards to many other questions like genetic engineering of food, for example, then I'd be for them. But I don't think you can be for them under capitalism because you never know, are they, it's like, you know, food production. The food corporations are not genetically engineering food because they care about feeding people. They now care about how much money they make. Now, you recently made a trip. You were in Vietnam, Morocco, and Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And at least two of those countries uh, claimed to be some form of socialism. <laughs> yes. Uh, Vietnam and Bolivia. Did you see any difference? Uh, quite the opposite in many cases. Certainly in Vietnam, um, there are lots of red flags and hammers and sickles everywhere and statues of Ho Chi Minh. Uh, and the government runs things. So, but it's very much state con a state-controlled uh, dictatorship or oligarchy. The, the ordinary people don't make any, any decisions, so it's got nothing to do with socialism. But what is happening is, under the onslaught of like globalized neoliberalism, the uh, Vietnamese state is saying, we need to do the same thing too. So they have been on a track of growth of 7.5%, 8%, which is definitely uh, expanded food production, so people don't starve in Vietnam anymore, in the way that was true of famines in the 70s and 80s, coming out of the war. But um, at what cost? I mean, it, it's absolutely completely unsustainable that Vietnam is talking about doubling the amount of en energy that they will be producing or require over the next 20 years, and the vast majority of that will be from coal and oil. And so we're t they're talking about using way more. On the other hand, they do need to develop, right? Their people need uh, certain basic things. And the same in Bolivia, there's been a lot of talk about the necessity of dealing with climate change and being environmentally friendly. Right. I think it's in the constitution. Yep. What's happening there? Uh, it's a little bit different in um, Bolivia because the social movements exist, right? There are large uh, social movements that actually are the reason that Evo Morales is in power in the first place. However, it's still very much about uh, growth, development, and that development is based on uh, fossil fuels, natural gas. And, and when you say living. growth development, I mean, uh, to be concrete, we're talking about you know tens of thousands of people that still live in terrible poverty. So it's not like just growth for growth's sake. It's growth that people should be able to eat and, and have uh, you know, subsistence. No, there are some very positive things that have come about with the election of Evo Morales. I think people there, and, and it's quite clear that um, development needs to occur because there are still many people without electricity, uh, many, many people without clean water or without sanitation, entire cities, uh, or regular access to water, let alone clean water. May, uh, I was talking to people in the south of Cochabamba. Uh, their community has water, uh, polluted water, they can't drink it, uh, two, two hours a week. So clearly there's a need for investment and for lots of money flowing into Bolivia to do social reconstruction or construction. And Bolivia has fossil fuels. And Bolivia has fossil fuels. So how do you escape that conundrum? Same I story think. for Venezuela or Ecuador. Yeah, I think it's a huge question. Uh, and that's why the people in the Global South governments, the people in the Global South social movements are calling for a couple of things. One is the eradication of all debt uh, that they owe from previous dictatorships or, or whenever to, to Western financial institutions. The way that the banks were forgiven uh, in 2008, countries in the Global South should be forgiven. And the second thing is they need uh, investment money. And there was, has been set up a climate fund that's supposed to have 100 billion in it by 2020. Uh, that's agreed upon from the rich industrialized countries to the global south to help them develop and adapt in non -pollut less polluting ways. But there's no money in it. Nobody's put any money in it. I assume, so I assume foreign investment primarily wants to invest in fossil fuel development. 
Absolutely. Uh, I was in the, uh, it was interesting because I was in the U.S. Embassy in Vietnam, uh, in Hanoi, and uh, in the same room at the same time was the head of USAID, uh, as well as the commerce attaché. So the head of USAID said, we cannot fund, they're in the same ministry within the United States government, Foreign Service. The uh, head of USAID said, we cannot fund anything that's related to fossil fuels. At the same time, when the commerce attaché spoke, he said, we'll fund anything. In fact, we're funding coal right now uh, in Vietnam. And so you've got this complete contradiction, which is similar to the larger contradiction of capitalism, that they say they want to do something and then they end up doing whatever's the most profitable thing because he wants to sell U.S. goods and technology to the Vietnamese uh, at a handsome profit. And even with the, these other programs going on, that uh, they won't do that. So um, I mean, One would yeah. think that in, in, in Venezuela's case, certainly, and, and also Ecuador and Bolivia, they could use some of the, f of the money they're getting from the fossil fuel revenues to diversify the economy. How much does that seem to be happening? Uh, I can't speak so much to Venezuela, but certainly in Bolivia, there are the funds from the nationalization of the gas industry are going towards social programs for women, for pension, for education. Um, but that doesn't necessarily diversify the economy. But it does not diversify, di diversifying the economy. And the I think similar. I mean, uh, what I know of Venezuela is somewhat similar. Right. The contradiction is, of course, once they have now nationalized them, so that, I mean, all the foreign companies are still there. The oil companies are still there. So it obviously wasn't that bad for them. They're still making money. Um, but the reality is that uh, now that this, the Bolivian state is getting more funds from fossil fuel production, why not produce more fossil fuels? Because you'll get more funds for these social programs. So then you get locked into that. Um, and mining has expanded hugely under uh, Evo Morales. And so how do you, you know, how do you escape that kind of paradigm of development that Western financial institutions, the World Bank, et cetera, will give you money for those things. Western corporations are happy to come in and make money with you and share their expertise at the same time as you've got this rhetoric of caring for the environment, when Bavir and so on. So uh, how do you square those two things when you know that the population is heavily impoverished and needs some social change and needs some basic uh, things that we take for granted, like electricity, like water. Um, I think that that is the huge challenge. How do you develop in an ecologically sustainable way that is also about uh, social justice? Okay, in the next segment of our interview, we're going to talk about what people should do and what kind of demands people should make. Uh, please join us with Chris Williams on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.